This candle is lit for us all, for our sacred time together in the presence of Almighty God. We may not be side by side. We may be even many hundreds of miles away from St Magnus Cathedral here in Orkney, but we are all part of this vibrant, worshipping, online Christian community. We are a contemporary church, a church for now. We are not settled down in one place but we gather here in the light of this candle, in faith. Look into the flame and give thanks for the awesomeness of God, the source of eternal love, the ever-loving Father who has our backs whatever we get wrong. And let's acknowledge honestly to ourselves and to God just how much we do get wrong no matter how hard we try to live at peace and in harmony with those around us. Let's admit our failings and then let them go into God's forgiveness. Look into the light of this candle and let it illumine all the sadnesses and worries of this last week. The people you wanted to help or to mend, but couldn't. The love that you wanted to share, but couldn't or didn't. The apologies you wanted to make, but they wouldn't come or were not heard. Bring all of that with you into this sacred space. Reflect on it. Lean into God's love. And then listen to him. Amen. Our first hymn is Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
Sometime later, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, Lake Tiberias, and a huge crowd followed him, impressed by the signs he gave by healing people. Jesus climbed the hillside and sat down there with the disciples. It was shortly before the Jewish feast of Passover. Looking up, Jesus saw the crowd approaching and said to Philip, where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? Jesus knew very well what he was going to do, but asked this to test Philip's response. Philip answered, not even with 200 days wages could we buy loaves enough to give each one of them a mouthful. One of the disciples, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, said, there's a small boy here with five barley loaves and two dried fish. But what good is that for so many people? Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, and as many as 5,000 families sat down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave them out to all who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, giving out as much as they could eat. When the people had eaten their fill, Jesus said to the disciples, gather up the leftover pieces so that nothing is wasted. So they picked them up and filled 12 baskets with the scraps left over from the five barley loaves. The people Seeing this sign that Jesus had performed, said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Seeing that they were about to come and carry him off to crown him as ruler, Jesus escaped into the hills alone. As evening approached, the disciples went down to the lake. They got into their boat, intending to cross to Capernaum which was on the other side of the lake. By this time it was dark and Jesus had still not joined them. Moreover, a stiff wind was blowing and the sea was becoming rough. When they had rowed three or four miles, they caught sight of Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. They were frightened but he told them, it's me, don't be afraid. They were about to take him into the boat, but suddenly the boat was ashore at their destination.
I can still recall a school trip to Interlaken in Switzerland when I was in my final week of fifth year at Annan Academy. The journey involved a coach from Annan, just near the Scottish border, to Folkestone, a ferry from Folkestone to Boulogne, and then a rather long train journey to our Swiss destination. We had been advised to take some food with us for such a long journey. My mother gave me enough sandwiches, biscuits and fruit that even by the time we got to Interlaken, there was still enough for me and my classmates who had also shared on the journey. And that wasn't a one-off. Mum ensured that there was always sufficient food for a journey, so much so that it became a bit of a family joke that she always gave us enough to feed the 5,000. I suspect the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is, is one which we have been very familiar with since childhood. It is the only miracle which is narrated in each of the four Gospels, and it is one which, I remember, caused us much awe and wonderment. So what happened on that hillside by the Sea of Tiberias? Some of you of a certain age may recall a BBC TV lecture series well over 50 years ago by the renowned Professor William Barclay of Glasgow University. One such lecture, on the subject of Jesus feeding the 5,000, has very much stuck in my mind. Barclay acknowledged the possibility that Jesus literally did multiply the loaves and fishes and certainly respects those who hold to that view. But he also recognises that some people might well be puzzled and he offers two possible other explanations. He suggests the possibility that this was indeed a sacramental meal. The words and actions of Jesus strongly foreshadow the words and actions used when Jesus instituted the Last Supper. It could be that each person received a morsel as we do at communion, and that the experience of doing so in Jesus' presence fully nourished their hearts and souls. But it was his further possible explanation which captivated me then, and still does. Having regard to the geography of the area, it is quite likely that the crowd who followed embarked on a nine-mile hike. And it's surely more than likely that they would have made preparations for such an expedition. That would have been customary at the time. And as with my mother, I like to think that the small boy's mother had supplied him with bread and fish for the journey. And it would only be human if the members of the crowd had selfishly opted to keep their own provisions for themselves. But when the boy offered his modest contribution, and when they saw Jesus thank God for it and start to share it, everyone who had anything followed his example. And then there was enough. Indeed, there was more than enough for everyone to be filled. As William Barclay expressed it, the presence of Jesus turned a crowd of selfish men and women into a fellowship of sharers. Is that not an even greater miracle? And is it not, too, a challenge which rings down through the ages? A recent Christian Aid newsletter stated, Right now, the world is experiencing a, dress a distressing surge in hunger. Today, millions of struggling families do not know where their next meal will come from, or if any food will come at all. According to the United Nations, hunger is currently the leading cause of death in the world. The overlapping crises of conflict climate change and economic inequality have created a cycle that has undermined food security for individuals and families worldwide. An example was given of a Kenyan family who were experiencing their fifth failed rainy season in a row. Their community struggles to grow crops, to eat and sell due to the prolonged drought. Millions of livestock have perished and the soaring cost of food means hunger is a harsh reality for their community. And I recall an event which I attended during COP26 in Glasgow, where an example was given of a Kenyan girl who, because of climate change related drought, often had to walk 20 kilometres to find and fetch 20 litres of water. Quite apart from the sheer physical effort involved, she ran a personal risk of assault and lost valuable time from her schooling. And we're all too aware that closer to home, Many families have a daily struggle to make ends meet. I was shocked and disturbed last autumn to learn that at a Scottish primary school, 
where pupils were being encouraged to bring food for the Harvest School Assembly, which would then go on to a local food bank. They were discouraged from bringing tinned beans, as some of the families who would receive them couldn't afford the gas or the electricity to heat them. These are challenges, global and local, to which we as Jesus followers are called to respond. In many respects, it goes to the heart of the gospel message. It is not only practical, arguably it is profoundly theological. It was Gandhi who said, To those without food, bread is the only form in which God dares to appear. And when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, there are millions who would say, if only. Just remember the parable of the sheep and the goats. Then the righteous will say, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Now that does not say that we do these actions for Jesus or because of Jesus, but we do it to Jesus. Jesus is in the face of each person who is hungry through famine, or who must walk 20 kilometres for fresh water, or who faces the daily dilemma of whether to eat or heat. And the converse is that if we fail to act, it is Jesus who suffers from that failure. I recently came across a verse from a Lutheran hymn book which powerfully encapsulates the nature of the challenge. Across the world, across the street, the victims of injustice cry for shelter and for bread to eat and never live before they die. And it's followed by a refrain, Then let the servant church arise, a caring church that longs to be a partner in Christ's sacrifice and clothed in Christ's humanity. What you may say, well, isn't it all just a bit too much? Isn't it too daunting a task? Are we to be like Philip and say, the task's just too big for us and we can't possibly afford it? Like the disciples, we can be paralysed by the scale of human need. Or should our role model be the small boy? He didn't have much, but what he had, he offered. We don't know his name, and I suspect he didn't know what Andrew or Jesus would make of his offering. But what he did has resounded down through two millennia. In the context of feeding the hungry, it is what we can possibly offer in material or monetary terms. But also surely there's a challenge that, of what we can offer in terms of our time and our talents. The Gospels recount many occasions where Jesus makes it clear that he wants to provide plenteously. Later, in John's Gospel, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. But just as the small boy's offering allowed Jesus to ensure that the crowd was filled, so our talents, modest or otherwise, in God's hands, can be turned to miraculous account, if only we offer. And a final thought. After Jesus had performed this miracle, and all too aware of the reports of the many things he had done and spoken in the locality, the crowd hailed him as a prophet and wanted to make him their king. That's why Jesus withdrew from the mob. They saw him as someone who would lead them, no doubt, to challenge or even overthrow the Roman occupiers. But they grievously misunderstood the nature of the kingdom which Jesus wanted to establish. The crowd misses the point. They want to use Jesus, or at least shape Jesus' actions, towards their own ends. But the real point is that we must allow Jesus to use us and what we have to offer to further God's kingdom of love and compassion, where people truly care about one another.
we light this candle in remembrance and hope to call to mind Magnus and Ronald and all the saints and all those dear to us who have gone before, especially those who have died in recent times, and as a sign of hope to future generations as yet unborn, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. A prayer. Bounteous God, you give us everything, and yet we never make the time to thank you enough for all that you have created and entrusted to us. We take so much for granted. The beauty of these islands that feed our bodies and souls, the pastures and seas providing food for us and people far beyond our shores the warmth of the sand beneath our feet and the joy of families playing on our beaches. Holiday times to welcome friends known and unknown. We ask your blessing on all who work in good weather and bad to keep our land and seas safe, clean and productive. The refuse collectors those who clean our streets after the nights before, the police, the coast guards. God of love, how can we understand starvation being the biggest killer in your world today when we have so much? Help us to share more willingly to know that we have enough and to acknowledge in thought and practice that others have greater needs than we do. We pray for those who run the Orkney Food Bank and those who need to use it and for all food banks everywhere. May giving to them, if we can, become as natural to us as doing our own shopping. We pray for farmers growing our food in this difficult year. For those who cannot afford fresh vegetables and fruit. We may not be feeding 5,000, but may we always be ready to share, knowing that we have so much more than we need. God of peace. We remember now all those whose lives are being destroyed by conflict. Relationships on the brink, made worse by holidays together. Those suffering domestic violence and others seeing their safe place becoming a place of danger for them. Those acknowledging that their relationship is beyond repair. Be with counsellors, families and friends, supporting all those going through breakups. And we bring before you all working to end the conflicts that should rightly dominate our news. In Gaza, Ukraine, so much of Africa and many other countries. As we pray for peace in your world, May we resolve to live in peace with all those around us. Amen.
let us now go out into the world in the power of Christ, as those who would see not only what the world is, but what we can make it be. And may our hands, our heart and our voice be turned towards making it so. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all, now and forever. Amen.